materials. I've submitted a formal complaint regarding banned books week. Happen in your email. Per the policy, I look forward to the school committee forming a committee to review this complaint. And I ask, I ask that those meetings be open to the public. I look forward to receiving a, a copy of the committee's report and recommendation in response to my complaint. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm Mara Kemmer. I live at 12 Wichita Road. Um, I have three children in the Medfield schools in second, fourth, and sixth grade. Um, I'm a clinical social worker by training. I've spent uh, just under 20 years working with adolescents and young adults, um, particularly on topics like reducing alcohol and other drug use, promoting healthy relationships, preventing sexual violence, promoting health and mental health in students. Um, here tonight to speak about concerns that I have over books being promoted to our middle and high school students. I want to start by saying that I think it's important and our district clearly works hard to ensure that our students are exposed to a wide variety of books that reflect diversity in race, ethnicity, gender identity, and sexuality. I applaud these efforts. I support this and this is not what my concern is about. What does concern me, for example, is a book called Flamer, a book available to the middle school population, a population like my son, who's 11 years old, and has a developmentally appropriate but limited understanding, exposure to, and grasp of context, concepts related to sexuality. The book includes explicit sexual and vulgar content. It's not 
coming of age content is an inclusive or teaching kids how to become comfortable in their own skin, how to be tolerant. It's doing nothing but teaching kids how to be raunchy. It's over sexualizing kids, normalizing things like pornography and bullying, where the data unequivocally shows these kind of things result in really concrete harms for our kids. In my experience working with adolescents and young adults, I can say there's been almost nothing more insidious or damaging than early regular exposure to graphic and gratuitous sexual content. It contaminates the development of healthy, positive sexual relationships in young people. Whether you've agreed with anything that I've said, I think we can all agree about the mental health crisis in front of us with our young people, our teens and young adults. I'm encouraged, grateful, and heartened by the efforts of you all in our district to offer more resources to our students in this area, to offer things that really help, like access to more counseling. So let's not do things that will undo those efforts and that progress. Let's not, when we know our youth have unlimited access to find whatever they want on the internet, let's not have our trusted role models, our faculty and staff, spoon feed this kind of content to our children. Content that negatively affects mental health, content that negatively affects the development of healthy sexuality. If there are parents out there that feel like this is something they want their kids to see and have access to, that should be their choice, but not imposed on us by the schools. Thank you. Um, here's an excerpt from the book, Claimer. Quote, we are each busting a load into this bottle. If you don't come, you have to drink it. Ha ha ha, end quote. This is a book that has been on display and is readily and easily available at Blake Middle School for our 11 to 14 year old children. The foul and disgusting language throughout the book is completely inappropriate and it ruins the message that should be taken away from it. A message of a boy who struggled and was teased due to his sexuality was gone as soon as mental images such as the example above are given. An excerpt from the book, All Boys Aren't Blue, that is promoted and available at the high school, along with Flamer, is quote, nervous and drunk, I listened and got on my stomach. He got on top and slowly inserted himself into me. It was the worst pain I think I had ever felt in my life. He then added more lube and tried again. There are so many more inappropriate and pornographic descriptions in this book that is made available for our children and your students as young as 14 years old. I understand and can acknowledge not all parents agree with me and have no problem allowing their kids to read this, but let's leave it up to the parents to decide. Our schools have no place to distribute these types of materials, and yet these books were proudly promoted and showcased by our high school librarian and K-12 library chair who said, quote, Two of the most banned books in America right now. I love them both so much as she displayed them on her social media. I'm not trying to sound like the mayor of Belmont from the movie Footloose, but in my opinion, this is blatant distribution of porno pornography to minor children, your students, from one of your employees and educators. If one of my minor children went to a friend's house and one of their parents gave these books, books to them to read, I would be calling the police and most likely pressing charges. What actions will you take to remove these books from our school libraries so our children are not exposed to this kind of filth? What type of disciplinary actions will you take against this employee exhibiting this behavior and di distributing this inappropriate content? And what policies will you put in place to make sure this is not a reoccurring issue? And who's going to stand by to make sure those policies are being followed? If you haven't noticed, you continue to lose more students each year to schools outside of our district. Just in two of the local K-8 private schools, there are 30 Medfield students attending. It is time to start taking some accountability and focusing on what changes need to be made to make Medfield Public Schools appealing for all of us who moved here to send our children to. I would love to see concrete policies that allow for a safe, inviting, and inclusive learning environment for all students in regards to curriculum and inappropriate materials. Thank you. Five Delaware Road. I have one child in district and two out of district.
Hi, good evening. I'm Flavia Benson, uh, Tenwood Fall Road here in Medfield. I don't know if you know who I am. I'm here today speaking as a lawyer. And I'm going to quote um, from the General Laws, Chapter 272, Section 28. Um, it is unlawful to disseminate any matter which is obscene and is punishable by the crime of disseminate. dissemination of obscene materials to minors of imprisonment to the House of Corrections for up to five years or to state prison for up to five years. So what I'm what I want to I don't know if you want to reach from this, but I want to, to address with you guys here today is that these uh, this pornography that is in our schools and has been allowed to be there by our library, and I don't know who else looks at the curriculum here. Anywhere outside of education or outside of where we are right now, if I gave that material to a kid in my house, I would go to prison. I would be fined. This is a crime. We are not supposed to be providing our children with this type of obscenity, which is not good for them. Now, the legislator has defined harmful to minors as follows. A matter is harmful to minors if it is obscene or if taken as a whole. It describes and represents nudity, sexual conduct, or sexual excitement. So as to appeal predominantly to the prurient interests of minors. Two, is patently contrary to the prevailing standards of adults in the, in the county where the offense is committed as suitable material for such minors. And three, lacks serious literally, liter, literary, artistic, political, or scientific value for minors. My question to you is what liter, literary or any type of uh, educational value does this pornography have to be in the schools where our ch children are attending. It's absurd. You guys need to re really take a good look at all of this stuff that is in the library that is pornographic material. It's not appropriate. There's no place in it for K-12. And really think about the fact that were it not for some exemptions where there is some type of artistic value, <laughs> this is a crime. Please keep that in mind. Thank you. I hate coming up here. I was hanging out with my family, watching Naked and Afraid, and now I got to come up and talk to you guys about porn. Hi, I'm Rick Fink, and I still live at 8 Donnelly Drive. Before I get into this, I just want to bring up two things. Jess Riley, last time I came up here and you weren't looking at anybody to speak and you were just, you know, nose to your notes or whatever, you said, oh, these are just the public comments. I would argue this is just the most important part of your meeting. We're all taxpayers and parents. So I think that you've misconstrued. Uh characterize that but what I do is that I just write all the comments so that I can hear them understand them and that is how I learn and how I absorb so I'm sorry that you would like me to have eye contact I'll go back and watch the um, I appreciate that the tape Great. after this so you, you feel like you have also Leo attention. I feel like you owe Miss McHugh here an apology as a taxpayer and a parent Several months ago, I watched on the video, uh, you interjected while she was talking, referring to what she was saying as arbitrary garbage. I don't think anything that anybody has to say here should be labeled as such. So floor is over. I'll, get, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the floor for my three minutes here and do that if you'd like. It's a good time to do that. Tick tock, Leo. Are you going to do it or are you going to just have a stare down here? You only have three minutes to let you done. Yeah, I got like another two minutes and 30 seconds. We're going to sit here and look at each other all night. Okay. You're a leader, Leo. Everyone take note of that. Leo Brem can't apologize to a taxpayer and a parent by calling their comments arbitrary garbage. Anyway, everyone here that I've heard, I disagree with everything you said tonight. I'm, I'm actually disgusted by what I've heard because. I just don't know why we're afraid of the male orgasm. It happens, okay, get over it. But the problem I have is that there's no parity, there's no equity, you know, because women have orgasms too, from what I've heard. I mean, so let's close the gap. I was thinking maybe we could get a prescription to the Penthouse Forum. Are you writing that down, Jeff, down Jess? Penthouse no, Forum? I just wrote down free speech. Okay, good. Penthouse Forum. I'm not even sure if it's still a thing, but you know, we could buy some back issues on eBay. I'd be happy to offer that. Or maybe the music department could pass out the lyrics and we could teach the kids Cardi B's whack. That's wet ass pussy. I mean, it's just as graphic and gets the point across. 
to all of our students. That sounds absurd to you, because it sounds absurd to me. I can't believe in 11 years I've lived here that I'd ever come up to the school committee meeting and talk like this to a bunch of adults, but it's ridiculous. I'll give you another opportunity to speak, Leo, and the rest of you. I just want to get on the record each school committee member's stance on these books available for children. <laughs> Start with Ms. Kirby. Do you have anything to say? Uh, Ms. Kirby, let's talk about first off. My last name is Kirby. Oh, okay. yeah. Don't forget the K. Kirby, go ahead. Actually, uh, the chair, Michelle. Yeah. Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. The chair, chair. Sorry. Sorry. Mr. Fink, we, this is not on the agenda. We are not allowed to deliberate. Okay. So if you'd like to reach out to us individually. Well, I just want to get on public record. If you're hiding behind a policy that you created, you can just simply sidestep that and just tell us what you think about the bugs. I paid 20 grand in taxes, 14 grand for which go to you guys. I feel like I've paid to be here at this podium. So how much time am I, how am I doing on time, Leo? It's it's over. I'm I'm letting you finish. Okay. All right, well, your silence is uh, heard loud and clear. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, it is Colin Fraterni. I don't have anything to share. Um, I'm a mom at that center for the public schools here at the Abbey um, until we get to middle school and then we've gone private. Um, and it's really disappointing. And for me, I mean, I've never been to a school committee meeting, but for me, it's not just about this book. This is just such a concrete, it's so disgusting, no matter where you stand on issues. It, I think this is like finally something that's happened where we can all come together and push back. Um, I've pulled both my son and my daughter from the middle school. We've tried it, tried it in sixth grade, tried to muscle through. Um, I honestly, like, it, it, there's no exaggeration. I just feel like we, we pulled my daughter because she felt like she was being persecuted for her religious beliefs. Um, and with all this talk of you know, sickness, and uh, she felt very excluded. Lots of teams. We coached her through the whole year. We had a countdown until she was eight. Um, so I just think that's really disappointing. And that's so I just wanted to, yes, obviously I share and we'll discuss books, but it goes far beyond the books. I think the, this issue is just one more blatant overreach. In agendas in completely inappropriate content that is not just there, it's not just that these books were hidden on the shelf. It's you're going out of your way to recommend them. Um, and, and there's plenty of other examples. So I just want to broaden it a little bit. I'm just a normal mom. Um, all of my toddlers, I don't want to be here as I go into three back to school nights. It's the last thing I want to be doing. Um, but it's important enough, and I just we need we need we need to change. We need to change. I want my kids to go to school. I don't want to be paying. I would think I mean we're paying attention everywhere we can, sending our kids to private school who moved here and we have public school. So yes. you know it's just we need to we need to make a change. Thank you. Thank you very much for your feedback, truly. Um, we have been hearing from residents since the beginning of the week, and we are listening. And I'd like to take this moment to allow Dr. Marsden, actually, and the administration and the librarian have met this week. So I would like Dr. Marsden to expand on that, please. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. So just a couple of things. Um, you know, first of all, from my perspective, um, I do not think that the middle school is an appropriate place for that, for Flamer. I just don't think it is. Um, that's my personal opinion on that. Um, I think high school is a very different story and folks can have a conversation around that. Um, what we've done is, as your policy says, put in place a procedure in district on how to look at reconsideration of books and, and literature. And I think that's what, you know, we, we put together a process and, and, a, and looking at doing a committee to kind of look at this and have parents or staff members that have issues with it or anything um, go through this process. So 
Um, maybe, Christy, maybe you could just quickly go over that um, the process we've established. And it, it's not a situation where one person makes a decision, takes it off the shelf, and that's it. There has to be a process where we engage faculty members, administrators, students, those kinds of things. So I think that's what we tried to do. And maybe just go over it quickly if you could. Sure. I'm trying to remind my interesting power the director of instruction and innovation. Uh, we have a two-tier process regarding any sort of reconsideration of instructional materials. But instructional materials is really broad. It means both classroom materials and library materials. And it's a thoughtful and thorough process that, I, that will allow us to review uh, different concerns. So the first step is the informal process. And that happens when a parent, guardian, community member, someone has a question or concern about a particular piece of material. And what they do is they first contact the direct, the person who has the most direct contact, the contact to the content. Uh, so it, usually that is a department chair, uh, could be a principal. Uh, and they, they really just discuss what the question is and what the concern is. Now, this comes through a number of times, and many times it's actually a concern is over a particular topic versus the instructional material itself. And that is rooted in our state frameworks which as a public school that we follow. So we have that discussion. However, if beyond that, if there's still a concern or a question, there's a, a formal process, and this is our formal review process, in which a person would put forth and fill out an online form. That online form gets submitted and then reviewed to make sure it is something that, first of all, is not a topic or a, a something that lacks the state frameworks, but rather specifically focuses on the instructional material itself. And at that point, if it's warranted, it, it gets put forth a committee. A committee is formed, and it's a wide variety of people made up of uh, the administration, uh, district administration, uh, principals, teachers, as well as the department chair. In cases of uh, grades, uh, middle school and high school, there would be a high school student as well represented in there. And at that point, the person put forth the, the concern as an opportunity to share their concerns, provide additional information and follow up, and have a discussion on top of really sharing that their, their concerns. At that point, the team deliberates, and we deliberate considering a whole bunch of things, including the alignment to the, the frameworks and the curricula, the context in which it's used, and, and of course, the submissions that are made by the people. Um, and at that point, a recommendation is made. And a recommendation goes forward. And the recommendation not only is just a verbal recommendation, it's also a written report. And within the written report, it's thorough. It's, it's the report is both majority, and the majority opinion, and the minority opinion. And, it's, and the, the recommendation is really the, the majority. So it's not a single person, it is a group of people putting forward that recommendation. And that recommendation is submitted to the superintendent for review. At that point, that's the final decision that is made. Sorry, a question. That's if um, reconsideration of a book that might be there. When a book is potentially crossing the line, how does it, what's the process whereby it's reviewed? before it might get there in the first place. The acquisition yes. of that? Yes. Acquisitions happen a variety of different ways. We have formal, for instance, textbook review committees for larger pieces of curriculum. Also, for, for students, like a classroom textbook, for instance, that is, that is done by the classroom teacher. Um, so there is a variety of different ways that the material gets into the classroom. And they, again, it depends on the scope of that. Right, currently we're, we're piloting a math curriculum. It's a very large scope that would be a very formal process versus something that's smaller. And I think we're currently reviewing the process in which um, library books are purchased, curated, and put out of the shelves. So we're, we're looking at that right now to so kind of review that a bit and see how that that's happens. That's the process. Sorry? That's the process now for purchasing library So the process is the librarian. Um, the, the school level librarian um, goes through the SACs in order of what he or she wants to order, and that's overseen by the content specialist, and then those get ordered and put in the building. So we're, we're just taking a look at that right now. 
So the same people who put this book on the shelf and a neighbor doing whether the book is appropriate. Because that's where yeah. we're concerned. concerned that that that's was, where we're concerned. Who's holding them accountable? Yeah. 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 yeah, that's one person to think. So there's to keep in mind so that there are multiple person. different. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so who like yeah. 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 so, yeah. so, 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 sorry, that wait, that it's, 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 sorry, one moment. If um, if you can just one person at a time, and I just, just yes, public, just let us have a couple of questions to clarify. I think people are really fired up, and sure. I and I understand yeah. that. So Same we time. just Same need time. to. Same yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I think our concern is that if it was just more than one person, how did multiple people miss this? And we, as you concerned citizens, would probably not want those same people reviewing whether or not it's appropriate. It wouldn't be the same people. Well, I guess that's that's that this is appropriate, we have a big problem. Exactly. And how can we trust what the health teachers are doing? What are the, what's going on in the classroom? What's going on? If this is okay, and if there's no action taken, to remove this See, I think the question is, is, was that process used for those books? No. I think that's the no. Okay. I think that's no, that process was not used for these books. Okay. Yeah, I'm oh, no, no, sorry, but that Maybe. process was not used for these books. Okay. No. So one person just ordered them? Correct. Okay. And so, so when they reviewed their books, when it's going to be filed as a complaint, they go back and review the books. I don't care. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, share with the library and the person that's looking for it. That's what they're talking the K through 12 chair, whoever it may be, is the librarian. Is the librarian. Right. Right. Using right. But I'm just I'm using it in general. Yeah, uh, let's talk about that. Though. They have reasons that they support the book. And in the, 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 in the uh, spirit of their multiple perspectives, that would be one perspective of multiple around the table. I would also say the person putting forward, and if there are multiple submissions, then there will be multiple voices. All those voices will be represented either in person or with the original submission. So the person who the books up is also the one who the library chair. That is. That makes sense. Thank you. I'm sorry. One last question. Thank you. Is the book still out? It's on the shelf. Yes. Okay. So I think we're missing a step in the process. I mean, there's this much concern. It should be removed. And then Start the feedback, but I think what we have in our procedure right now is that the book stays there until the decision is made. I think that's true. Right. So keep exposing the kids and the kids. Isn't allowing the kids to write. Actually, parents and guardians also have the right not to have their child pick up the book. Oh, uh, no, 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 no,
right, new business, summer projects. Thank you, Madam Chair. Michael has a presentation that was in your materials that outlines all the summer projects that we did on our, our facilities. I'm going to share that for us now. As I said in the, the materials, um, we got a lot accomplished this summer and really thankful to the community and the town for uh, providing us with a capital budget to do all this. And if you, when you drove up tonight, you saw all those little huge boxes right out there. That's yeah. the new roofing that finally came in. So we've been waiting since April, Michael, we posted that. April. April, we posted that and it just came in today. So they'll be um, working on the roof at the lake to hopefully prevent another leak like we had in the springtime. Mm. The time is not ideal because they're going to have to work on that. Yeah, it's not great. But it needs to get done. Also at the high school, uh, replaced the uh, carpet, the guidance office, which is similar to what we see. Um, and we had some smaller uh, projects that we also were able to touch and make the patch. We still have um, HVAC that has the patch HVAC over the library has been replaced uh, during the summer. There's two more units that are going to be placed for one of all of it. So it's great. Uh, at the middle school, uh, we replaced the uh, boiler and the water heater. Uh, they were uh, completed last week. Uh, it's our uh, um, heat pumps, uh, which is going to be uh, installed at Lima. Uh, that was installed at the middle school. Uh, so you should be seeing savings there. And also, the middle school. Um, it's a work since grade wing where we are uh, replaced some ceiling tiles and some property in the area where they need to be. The main office and the library uh, carpet was also replaced, and we also did a section for the uh, maker space area, uh, which looks really, really nice if you haven't seen it. Uh, actually, go in and look at it because it's a big space. And, yeah, the tile and makerspace area really makes a difference. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, that's an area that gets real messy and the kids are doing a lot of different projects in there. And to have tile instead of instead of carpet there has been phenomenal. Okay. Um, at Dale Street, uh, a lot of work that we did with the front college will be there. Not our full uh, repair that we want to do, but uh, we were able to repair that. Um, and I think that we were painted from the across. Uh, the classroom ceilings, there's three classroom ceilings that we uh, done, and also lighting, um, which is possible to also uh, replace. Those were on, I believe, the second floor of uh, the whole section of the building. Um, I forgot to put in the presentation, but we also changed all the classrooms in the uh, box. Uh, so all of those have been uh, moved out. Uh, so that was a safety issue that we had at Dale, right? We had uh, door locks, some of them 
worked better than others and there wasn't one key for all that. So we had uh, put that in our capital because we wanted to make sure that we could lock all those rooms for lockdown purposes or whatever and make sure that um, that was consistent. So a consistent key throughout and new locks in, in the entire building. Uh, we also did some abatement and um, at the old section of uh, Taylor Street. Um, and we did new flooring to install the new flooring in the new hallway. Uh, we want to do that. Uh, a lot of people in the section come to it. Um, but it looks brighter now. Uh, uh, we repaired the uh, bathroom, which is the anchor in the music room. Um, Topic the walls and ceiling cards. It's never all well replaced with the car. That's where we had it so we had to replace the new car in that condition. And that was all insurance. All and that insurance. was the, the reason why we had the modular out there that entire time. So once that was completed, the insurance company finally took that lovely modular out of there and we got the parking spaces back and we'll look at that um, container anymore. And then at the Relox pool, again we took the front hallway by the cafeteria. That's a new um updated that for it and place those guys. Uh, the goal is to actually continue to the opposite hallway um, at the office. We also uh, are need that for the project for the pump uh, water tank or domestic pump tank at the V lock um, that was delayed due to material. And that um, the lead is going to be installed um, at the end of September in uh, that's a smaller project. Um, but that's also one of the projects that uh, has been completed. Uh, we're also proud that we put in uh, TV stations at the uh, Lock and the Advent School. Um, infrastructure is there. The actual uh, stations are not quite in. Uh, we're we'll waiting for stations to come. We'll be coming in from Canada, so um, that's there. But we will have two stations at Lock. We'll have two stations also at Blake. Um, with our uh, consultant on, on that and uh, other projects that we're going to be bringing up in the central organization. The organization we want to put the solar panels. There's going to be some canopies that we're looking at uh, in the walkway from the middle school and high school, and possibly uh, over the parking lot. So those are all projects that uh, we want to you know, bring up to the middle auction. Forward with uh, the spring and summer uh, uh, projects that again are important. So, we did get some calls that people thought we were putting up the cell tower at Blake uh, while that construction was going on. So, we just had to clarify that. But, we put a couple calls on that. I know that they're they actually have been working at the one they're doing behind Town Hall um, all of this week. It looks like they put the pole up and they're almost complete with the one at Town Hall. So, that was part of. The work that Michael had done and worked collaboratively with the town to get the charging stations on, on town owned property. And then at Memorial, uh, we uh, new ECT for on the Adams Street wing. Um, that was done. We buy our long term, it's also uh, it was a memorial. Uh, and then we did uh, a couple of uh, AC units, uh, which are split units uh, for the uh, technology. Uh, and uh, the light pole uh, replacement. In fact, the fall last spring, it, uh, one of the bus brains, the pole that was actually replaced this week. Um, and, and like I said, I think we do still have some smaller projects that we're working on. Um, the, the major projects, most of the major projects, I'd say 90% of the projects are going to be somewhere in that two bus brains that we're working on. Thank you. There's so much work done. Yeah, thank you, Michael. It's really it's nice to, to see. <laughs> All righty. Summer projects agreement for allocation of annual costs. So the auditors in town, uh, when they were doing the end of the year project audit, uh, recommended that the school committee look at this and, and re vote it because it hasn't been re voted in a long time. So, Michael, kind of fill you in on, on what this is and what the impact is. So there is an agreement between the select board and uh, the school committee that was established probably 20, 25 years ago, uh, which creates a 
climate between the Department of Early and Secondary Education and the youth, um, where the funding, the certain funding sources that are on the town side that have to be allocated back to the school side, such as crossing guys or a resource officer. Um, those are expenses that are on the town side. But when we do the, the end of year report, which we're working on currently, um, we have to allocate those funds from the town into the school side. That agreement has to be between the select board and the school board. We are not uh, suggesting any changes in the way we allocate the funds. We're just asking that the school board, uh, the select board, as we decided uh, simply with it months ago, um, that the school committee look at it and um, sign and agree with the current agreement that we have on file. And then I will submit this back to the Department of Education and submit it to our auditors so we can uh, forward with our end of year report. Michael, um, you submitted to the board, the uh, Board of Education. The Board of Selectmen already signed it. Yeah. Um, so and then the Board of Education, just because they're at once it's full time. Like, yeah, once it's full time, we okay. send it to the Department of Education. So when they review our end of year report, they can do the allocations on how uh, what the agreement is between the parties. So Michael, there's nothing changed in here as it's the same as it has been for the last 20 years. Right. So, so the auditors did review it and they, don't, they didn't make any changes to what the uh, So in your materials, you had a memo that was written by Dr. Power to me. Um, she went through a lot of curriculum materials in the, in the past few months, and there are some outdated materials that it either we're not using or um, they were published before our standards have been updated statewide. Um, so we, we're asking for your approval to dispose of those. I guess that's a clarifying question. Sure. When we say dispose, where does the book or material go? Is it recycling it? Does it get donated? Like, where does it go? Well, we try to recycle first, okay. and if we can't recycle, then we typically go okay. away from it. But, but it's not so like it's, being passed on to another school district, right. like outdated things we're not passing on to other places. No, I think if it were, if we had materials like whole class sets of things, then we would be equipped to do that with some mm -hmm. of the materials. But because there's is one of one of each or three or yeah. or two, it's just not. You know, feasible. people don't want just one copy of something. Right. And then also, just who would want to disseminate something that's so out of date to, to another place, right? You'd be surprised who would want that. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's coming back around in some of these yeah. things. So Lucy Cockins, I see the 1986 version of Lucy Cockins in here for writing. It is. <laughs> but it's, it's a little it bit of a third rail right that there. We already have. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Same with the bonus for now, we have updated stuff. So, so oh. do you have a discussion? Okay. Um, do we have a motion to approve the disposal disposal of outdated curriculum materials? So moved, Tim. So moved, Tim. Second. 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 Leo, all in favor? Aye. 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 Wonderful. Thank you. Um, the high school model UN club annual conference triple approval. Yes. Yeah, so any materials you have the letter um, from Rachel Buckingham, who is the advisor. Of Model UN, we've had really good feedback in this program. Uh, kids have done a great job with it. It's over. It's at Brown University this year um, in Providence, and it's a couple of overnights. So typically, anytime there's any out of state or overnight trip, we ask for your blessing on that. So I would ask that you approve as presented by Rachel. We have a motion to approve the uh, Model UN trip to Brown. So moved. So moved. Leo, second. 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 Michelle Kirkby, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm so excited for these okay. kids to be doing these great things. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Wonderful. Any other items since posting? Um, I feel, other than the fact that I just, if I could just address maybe the letter that I sent out on the right. Yes, hand, please. Um, so I sent, as you know, I sent parents the 
the update for the rankings, uh, some of the information that we found out. Uh, and initially, we had thought that it was 11 students that we had miscoded when we looked at the, the first uh, batch of data, which we ended up miscoding those, but that had nothing to do with um, the college attendance that Jesse had put together. So those 11 students were either uh, gap year, military, or employed, and we had coded them as unknown. So they had no impact on students that were in school. But as we, we looked at it a little closer, and um, I talked with folks at DESE, either whether it was um, folks that were in the data piece or the commissioner, um, it was very clear that there were some of our students that were not counted in attending college. And, and how it works is really interesting. I didn't know how it works, and no one else seemed to know how it worked until I got the information from that, but meaning outside of DESE. Uh, so what tends to happen is we send all of our data of graduates to DESE. They sit on that for 10 months. So in the March of their second semester in college, they run an analysis. They send all the data to a third party, National Student Clearinghouse. They run an analysis of our graduates against the college information that they have. So in this case, um, as they told me, they have 99.3% of the colleges represented that participate in this student clearinghouse. When they ran that data on that particular day in March, whenever that was, um, 23 of our kids were left out. So when you look at that data point, you look at it over 10 years, we're typically between 90, 91, 92, it averages a little over 90 over 10 years. Um, it came out as 78.5. So that was really the red flag for us that something's going on with that. It didn't make much sense to us. So we went through that and, and spoke to Desi. They were very helpful. Um, I had two meetings with Boston Magazine, uh, the research editor twice. Um, they were, you know, they were good. They wouldn't let us know what their algorithm was and what they weighted, um, what items and what data points they weighted. However, they said to us, you can assume that based on that data mistake, that it did impact negatively your ranking. Um, they also said that they would actually redo our ranking if Desi would agree to change the data. So that was our meeting with Desi after that. Um, so long story short, Desi would not agree to that. And, and, and their logic is, I understand their logic. You know, their logic is that we had a data, uh, we took all the data on that certain period, whether it was three or four days in March, and that's what we use for our comparison. Now, in our case, the data wasn't good data. It was incorrect, it was 23 kids missing. Uh, we confirmed with those 23 families that their child was actually in school during that time. So we did that extra step to make sure that we, you know, they were confirmed they were there. Um, and if they were to run it again now, you know, they would say it would be um, not consistent data across the state. So if you ran Medfields in September of 2022, you read anyone else, everyone else's in March of 22, that that's not a consistent like data source. So, that was, so they can't backdate it. So no, they, they can't back to so Jeff. So the question I, yeah. I have is how did the 23 get left out at this if we reported them? We reported them. And that was confirmed. How did the day how did the Desi miss it? Desi didn't miss it. Third party did. Third party. Desi sent all of our data that was confirmed correct. Okay. So they're talking about so they're leveraging this third party. They have a contract with them to do this to do so this. So they work. can use the data. Right. Just trying to see who's paying who here in this scenario, right? So Jesse has a contract yeah. with the National Student Clearinghouse, right? Yeah, um, and then they publish this data on the website. Jesse does. Yeah. So Boston Magazine said we don't do anything but go to the Jesse website, and just take it right off. That's right. all we do. We, we don't have nothing yeah. scientific about it. We take all the information. We literally send it to a guy at Babson College who has his own algorithm. He runs it through and spits everything out. That's all. So I, they wouldn't let us in on the waiting because I had a, a concern with a couple of their data points that don't seem like they make much sense to be ranking schools with. Um, but you know, they they said it's only one person, and that's kind of how they do it. Uh, I mean, I think you well, look at magazine stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, you look at to me if you if you want to do a comparison, if you want to look at an apples to apples comparison of. An assessment that everyone has to take, same time frame, same standard, same everything, right? Yeah. Which would be MCAS in my mind. Yeah. So you look at that MCAS, and and then you look at Midfield High School MCAS, and how we did 
compared to the top 50. Okay. So our, our language arts MCAS was higher than number one Weston. It was higher than number four Manchester Essex. It was higher than Lincoln Severy number eight, higher than Littleton number 10, and higher than Andover 12. It was tied with Winchester number two, Wayland number five, um, Acton Boxborough six, and Hamilton one and 11. So if we're looking at an actual data point that is consistent because AP is not consistent across the state. Everyone does it differently. Everyone is different, every town has different rules, but the consistent you know, uh, assessment that goes across, that's how we fare, right? And then you look at, at math, yeah. we were higher than number four, Manchester, Essex, higher than Wayland, higher than Acton Boxborough, higher than Anthony Wenham, higher than Andover. So, you know, academically, if we're gonna look at it that way, which is our business, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah and let's not forget too, the MCAS is the snapshot of a kid on one day. Correct, <laughs> yeah. correct, but it's a consistent, yeah. so there's two, but it is consistent. Mind, there's, there's, two, yeah. there's two apples to apples you can do on a DESI's data. Yeah. One is uh, per pupil expenditure and MCAS scores, right? Those are ones that you, you can probably lump in graduation, you know, which we were, you know, 98% sure, or whatever. Right, yeah. um, you could probably do that too, but there are some that, um, I'm not sure teacher evaluation is the best one to use when you're ranking. I'm also a little curious about the, I didn't realize about the National Clearing Student Clearinghouse. You yeah, know, no one did, Leo. Colleges are clearly selling that that data, there's the, the student data. And so I'm curious as to what that gets used for. I mean, it's obviously not for us, but definitely, you know, as a data privacy point. At the same time, I've always when I've looked at that number and we knew it was part of rankings, right? Um, we knew that the uh, piece is, but how often do they follow up on that following year? Right? Do they make it to sophomore year, right? And so do they make it to junior year? Uh, or they move colleges and they lose track, right? They switch colleges. And they claim so. that even if they move colleges, that 99.3% of colleges participate with them. And they'll be able to catch a student that goes somewhere for their sophomore year or the junior year, or takes a gap year maybe, and starts. Maybe by name. That fall right? But there's no, there's no common identifier. You know, they would have to use multiple fields to identify that student. It's because it's not like the, you know, like we have a state ID here, you know, right. for every student. Um, it doesn't exist from college to college. So, uh, so I don't know how that, I'm curious as how they're doing. I think I've, I've seen a lot of holes you know, in the process as far as a data person goes. Yeah. I, mean, I could defer to the uh, Domo gentleman. But it's also, <laughs> it's also data that we, we submit correctly. Yeah. And then yeah. it gets analyzed 10 months after they graduate our schools and then we're based on bad data set, right? Right. So it's you know, so I wanted to you submit it to Tessie, Tessie submits it to the third party, third party submits it to in this case lost it. Oh, back, to Des back to Desi. Back to Desi. Desi publishes yeah. it on the website. Yeah. And Desi then Boston it. So it's like, we, 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 we would like to be keep our eye on this way when they publish. That's hard when they publish mm -hmm. publish. You saying Desi then publishes it? Desi then puts it on their website. Yeah. So, so there's I a zillion data points that we yeah, have assessed. Yeah. I, think, like, you know, yeah. I think the commissioner yeah. needs to make a point. I think the commissioner owes it to you as superintendents, all of you, to be aware when that publishing happens, right? When those things are updated. We don't know when that Exactly. Right yeah. now, you don't know when to go. And the commissioner was, was great. I mean, he um, we, we did a couple of phone calls. Uh, and he had his, his associate commissioners, you know, talk to us over the phone and kind of go over the process and how that all works. Uh, they were very very helpful, but um, I understand why they can't do it for Medfield because then there'd be 27 other districts that want the same kind of second look. What would that mean? There's 27 other districts that have. Yeah, Could be. I mean, I'm making up that exactly. number, but yeah, you know, I, I just think that I think it's too the data is too important not to have it lock solid, you know, and not yeah. to have it double triple checked before it gets back and published, and we don't have that opportunity. Well, and also it's an external, uh, it's an external pressure on our kids, on our parents, yeah. on everyone. You know, Boston Magazine is not an educational authority on anything. They're like crunching data, yeah. right? They're selling oh, yeah. magazines. Yeah, U.S. One day, one day news, <laughs> yeah. U.S. News and World Report is crunching data. They come up with, you know, better numbers, but really they're just as meaningless and they're selling magazines. And I... I really think that there's a larger philosophical conversation here about how intensely um, people feel about these external rates, these rates that are these kind of rankings that that don't really
doesn't particularly have a whole lot of batting, you know, like there's no apples to apples across the board of any of these. And then you get one post and it's like, oh my God, we're 52. And yeah, I'm, I'm, it is unfortunate that you have had to spend quite so much time trying to straighten out Boston Magazine and try to, it clearly has been educational and eye-opening, but that is time that, you know, people get so angry about it, not social media, and at the same time, you know, we worry so much about the pressure on our kids. We spend so much time talking about their mental health and, and yet there are these external pressures that we put on them to essentially represent our town. And you think like, well, okay, institutionally, how, how, how do, we, just as a culture, I think even in town, how do we rectify that? How do we say we wanna support our kids as much as possible and we're going to place our kind of sense of value on rankings that we can not necessarily have any kind of impact on really, really except doing the best that we can do at all times. But I think it's we just have to be careful, I think, because you know we can't we can't want a parade when we, we get a really nice one and then we can't poo-poo it when it comes out this way. Yeah. My first summer here, here we didn't we didn't throw a parade in the US news and no, I know that, I, but, so we, but we people were happy it. about that. You know, I mean, I, I think we just got to be careful with that. My first summer here, um, I remember meeting with uh, Mike Sullivan, and the rankings came out when I was here, and it was 37. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to Mike, talking to Mike about, it, like, ah, you know, we never do well on on Boston Magazine. And then I remember talking to leadership, and they said, oh, we never do well in Boston Magazine. And it was just this kind of like default. You know, we never do it. And I said, well, why? You know, just kind of. So I think, I mean, I don't think they're great. I don't think the end all be all, but people pay attention to it. Well, yeah, you know? because it's numbers, yeah. right? It feels good to, to pay attention to numbers. But I well, think that you have sales to guy, really... you can pay attention to a lot of sales well, people here number, in town that pay attention to numbers. I, I get guess, it. So we, we numbers are easy. so much on mm -hmm. numbers that I think we need yeah. to focus on the kids. Yeah, 100%. And our kids do so well. I am so proud of them. I know. You know, two of my kids have graduated from the school. I know countless kids. I'll never forget just a couple of weeks ago, I saw a group of boys who maybe graduated two years ahead of my oldest son, you know, 2017 or something. They all came together. And I think I spoke at their graduation, but they were so polite. They were telling us, you know, I was sitting with a group of moms, what they were doing, the job they had. These are, our kids are high functioning great kids who do well this mother just Many the other of their day kids are in that, but there are some other kids who just get in the door and that is the best thing yes, that they exactly. have been able to do and that is the greatest achievement for sure that day for them and, and, I, and I think that we need to appreciate district all of has that focus so much on yeah. the social and emotional because I think there were higher stakes before and yeah. it just it was crashing for some so I think I would like to believe that we're finding more of a balance. Our kids, you know, are doing well and we're trying to support them, you know, um, social, uh, social emotionally. So um, I think, I mean, I've just seen it over the last, I mean, even on the time that I've been on the committee, just how far we have come and how much effort we have made and tried to be so creative and keep on pushing around how we support our kids. I just, Again, I think it is worth saying to the community, let's let's think about how intent we are on how we do on these kind of random families. I'll say it, you know, maybe not popular, but I think it's important that we talk about how it also affects our kids. It doesn't just affect us. You know? And 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 the teachers, you know, they're they're doing they're doing a great job. And um, so, I don't know, it's about people to me, yeah. but I understand that it's easy to look at numbers, yeah. you know, it's like looking at It's reassuring. But <laughs> I mean, I understand. It it is, but, time you know, I think we're so anxious all the time. You just look it's at the rank number and then you look at the devil in the details, which like I just described where we're doing better academically on that exam than right. other districts that were in the top 15 right. consistently, you know, and I think, we, I mean, nine out of the, nine out of the top 15 were either tied or better than or language arts and 
Okay. And that's yeah. again across the board, that's that's an important assessment. And and, it's, and for 10th graders, that decides what they graduated on. So it's an important assessment. Yeah. You know, when it comes to these rankings, and you know, there's even a national rankings, as you all know, right? And I've had the I've had the opportunity to step into many of these school districts across the country. And you know, the there, there is no I, I can't imagine that there's any one you know scenario where uh, the attributes of any of these schools. Uh, makes one any better than another, uh, you know, particularly here in Massachusetts. You know, when you look at the the quality of uh, the opportunity of education here in Massachusetts across the board in many of our communities, um, because many, but not all. It, I, I want to always bring out that fair enough. There are yeah. a lot of places There's in Massachusetts a lot of challenges. that don't have to That's right. Um, exactly. Yeah. Right. And, and and I think that we use them to the you know we use our advantages for the best of our children, right? And yeah. I think that's the point. And that's why you know we had a room full of people here tonight because they're invested in their children and they care about the education of their children, right? And 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 so on. So there are places you know that that wouldn't happen, right? So uh, and those are the main differentiating factors in the success of our students, right? People's parents are involved in their education and part of, and part of that process. And so I would leave it at that. But, it's just ranking the numbers and they fluctuate all the time. Um, they go up and down. I highly recommend Melvin Gladwell's podcast on how the college <laughs> ranking started. If you day. actually listen to that, it is the most amazing. It really is. Eye opening. Awesome. And that's where I, I just, so much of it is about networking, who you know, who knows whom. And, you know, it, it's just, it's appalling, actually, it really is. But in any case, I, I feel like I just needed to say my piece about that a little bit. But we can move on. All right, old business, new elementary school project. Well, the application was accepted by the Board of Selectmen. And I cannot wait until we can form an SDC. Yes. So we are due to have. Um, we have to, um, I reached out to the Long Meadow folks about how their process, I, I was doing a search and I liked how they did their process. So um, I have been in communication in the past with um, Gus and Scott, and I just want to um, see if we can align a little bit with that process. Um, how Long Meadow did it, they had one Google form. You can like, you know, um, are you applying for a board of selectmen or are you applying for a school committee position? Um, they had a beautiful process and um, I was hoping that at our next workshop, we could spend <coughs> some time on the process and then get going at, along with the other topic at the, at the workshop that we're gonna discuss in a second. Okay, I just have a question. Um, one, thank, thank you for all the work going out to the you know, board of selectmen meetings. Thank you for that. Um, I know the two of you were there. <laughs> yes, yes we were, but I may not go back. And thank you, <laughs> you know, to the board of selectmen of the town for accepting it, what we have to say out there. Um, relative to, you're talking about our process for four, and then there's a broader process for 12, yes. if I'm not mistaken. Yes. I think um, we do, is anybody coordinating what is that how does it, how do we get to the 12? I think that that's kind of what the animation When you yeah, try saying that workshop that. though. Oh, I'm talking two, about for us. For us amongst our four. Us amongst our four. Okay. So we're not in charge of the total. Okay, so there's, there's work stream A, which is our four. Working together, yes. Work stream B, which is how do, or is anybody thinking about, hey, how do we get to the 12? I think we need to focus on an, our lane, but big picture, I think we'd like to, you know, Work together as well. Does that make sense? Kind of At least correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I absolutely agree. So then yes. the trigger to make that happen might be. Well, I mean, the AG has to send back the legislation after they viewed it. So that yes, but we can still move forward. We can move forward, but if there's start a committee and well, can we actually if this start our start, but No, not start yeah. the committee. Choose our people right to serve. So we we can kind of choose but you know I, I know that there was a lot of feedback 
about why haven't you done this yet? Why haven't you done this yet? And that, you know, because there is a bylaw that we needed to pass at town meeting um, that has not yet been approved by the legislature and or by the AG. And when that happens, assuming that it comes back without uh, without modification or, you know, that that that's when you can actually get the SBC in place. Um, and so I think it's important to be able to pull the trigger, but I do think that the public needs to know that it's not like we're just dawdling. Right. It's if there but are a lot of things the SBC has needs been to do. Now, yep. So the gates are open and now we have to we have to choose our path. Yep. Yes. So, so, and, and so then by law it gets approved. And then, you know, I'm just wondering, like, if you talk about a workshop, maybe it's a workshop with the, uh, the Warren Committee or the Select Public School Committee that says, hey, let's talk about how do we, well, I think little, we want to do our workshop yes. first to be able to establish our process. To choose our four. To choose sure, our four. Sure. So, so that, all that's okay that. if the bylaw is approved by the AG next week. I would just like to be, I would like to think that we're not going to be like a three month process. No, no, like no, I, no, I would no. just like to say. Yes, we can begin. Sorry? What was the October 2nd date? Was it by October 2nd or we're going to get notified on October 2nd? Oh, for the bylaws. By, yeah. by, by, okay. So if we're, we're saying, hey, we can have a workshop on the 20, we're talking about the 23rd. Yeah. Okay, so we would do that. Then maybe it is, and we might do this. Be more appropriate, I guess, for you as chair with the foreign committee. And yes, I will reach out. Select and say yes. we should have a yes. tribunal. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's sweet. It's all a tribunal. Yeah, you were, anyway, you were, there was some concern earlier. Uh, I thought someone had mentioned what happens if someone applies to each group or something along those lines. Right. Yeah, we that, talked right? about it at the board. So I, 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 yeah. I think it's all going to work out. It's going to work out. I think if we're gonna have a workshop, let's have a dual workshop on that and talk about space needs. Um, because it, it, since they are on the I same think, yes. yes. So I think that needs to be its own When I say space needs, I'm not talking about the middle of the building. There's a fe okay. formal feasibility <laughs> study. Right. Yeah. Uh, but we I, I'm not gonna playing. comment too much about the meeting that I saw the other night. No, not but, too much, but but the one of the things that was clearly you know escaping um, uh, Mr. Murphy was the uh, the fact that the fees, which he's fully aware of the process. I felt he was being unfair to you both in the meeting, asking the questions he was asking you, particularly because he just gone through the process or was aware of the process that we had just gone through. So, uh, and that is the feasibility study. You know, whatever that is. You know, when we you know, there's, there's guidelines around schools that we can go through, and deciding on the number of students is still equal, just like Dr. Mark Dr. Marston said. The you know the size of the classroom, the class sizes we're gonna support, you know, and, uh, and the spaces we need for special education and so on. So um, I think that um, all that will be flushed out not, not having that conversation. I just think also that we should prepare to have alternative space needs that we need to address now because we have a space problem uh, at Dale today. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of kids in my daughter's classroom, you know, uh, in a very small classroom. Um, designed in a time where we had small class sizes here because it was a small town, right? So, um, oh, and, and learning was different because we all sat in rows and looked straight ahead and did <laughs> and wrote memorization to be able to kind of perform the work that was available at that time. Yes. We were training people. Training to be instructor workers. Uh, or, or, so, or, yes. Or, or, so essentially, or. the application has been approved. Thank you, Board of Selectmen. And, um, uh, I thought, you know, it was a, a fruitful discussion, and I think we're going to have many workshops, but I think this first step would be to establish our process to select our four. Um, yes. That's, that's yes. That we have a lot more work to be done, for sure. Um, at least we can now begin, and I feel good about this. Um, any other comments about the like I don't have like a comment comment, but I don't know if anybody got the hometown weekly today, but Richard Disorder did like 
a thing on Memorial and like kind of the history of it. And the thing that struck me, I brought it actually, but I'm not gonna read it. But um, he goes the history of Memorial, but like it very, it's very cyclical in regards to like us having these giant enrollment challenges, us having facilities issues, us having enrollment challenges, us having facility issues. And I just, I just thought it was very well timed on how it came out because I feel like one of the things I think I'd like us to be able to look at from like a town standpoint is. Is that the cycle we want to continue when we're looking at what we want to be doing with the, whatever the new space is? Or do we want to be in a place to try to finally maybe break the cycle a little bit and do something that can last the town for maybe more like 50 years or something like that? I'm a little worried right now um, as we look at some of these pieces that we'll just be putting like a Band-Aid solution on or kind of kicking the can down the road for the next generation to deal with it. And I just hope that we can find a place where we can kind of really take that holistic big picture, look at everything and figure out what we want, not we like us, like we as a town, what do we want our legacy to be? What do we want to leave? What do we want to make better? Because I feel like we have an opportunity to do that here, taking the failed vote and turning it, you know, taking lemons and turning them into lemonade, right? Like what can we do here to like make things better? It is so just mandating. If anybody, like, just grab your hometown weekly, I know sometimes it ends up in recycling, but, like, right inside the second page, and I just, I don't know, like, it was very, I was like, oh, that's, oh, wait, but that was 1950, and we're in 2020, and this sounds very familiar, yeah. so. And it, it, it always goes up to, you know, like, it's referred to as value engineering, right? Yeah. We'll start with, everyone goes in with that atten intention, right? Just like we did when we were going to look at the three-grade school, right? We had all the best intentions to build that 50-year school, because that's, exactly how the conversation goes with the NSPA. They say, you're building a school that's going to be there for 50 years. You shouldn't have to tack on extra stuff. On. Right. We need it to be efficient and be able to last solidly for that 50 years. And that's what we want to, that's what they were going to put money behind. But what, you know, what ends up happening is, is, you know, we were fearful in the pandemic, so we trimmed it back a grade, you know, to bring the class down because we weren't sure what was happening as the outcome of the pandemic. And, um, and then we were, uh, you know, and then we were still, you know, messing around with that. And the price came down and the price came down. Um, and unfortunately what happens is then you start cutting things and you start cutting into that 50 years too. Right. right. And memorials oh. that I hear, we just replaced the flooring at Memorial, you know, that, that building that was only renovated 20 years ago. Right. So, yeah. um, and it's at capacity. So right. at the time it wasn't thought of, or I'm sure the proposal came through and then, you know, what could the taxpayers afford at the time? And I don't remember what that Renault you know, project probably cost. I'm sure I'm just possibly nervous that is that number, maybe. Uh, and the second uh, vote that went to action that it happened. Oh, it took so two they're votes. very much yeah. in the same kind yeah. of vote. Yeah, but just, I same mean, I know, like, right. I, re I recognize that that's how it happens. And if that's yep. the cycle that we want to continue, like, and that's what the people want, that's fine. I just hope we're able to take that look and maybe try to try to move a little bit more forward thinking because we, I feel like a lot of the town has. Um, become invested in this process, right? Like, I think a lot of people really do care. And like, I guess I ask them what they want their legacy to be. And if their legacy is 20 years is good for us and someone else can figure out 20 years, then that's what we can figure out. But if people want to make a more lasting impact on the future of the town, I think that's something we should be looking at as well. I think that's an excellent thing for part of the communication, perhaps, you know, that's part of, you know, that, that process of engaging the town, right? What the legacy to be. Right? Perhaps, and this may sound crazy, but perhaps I think all the taxpayers' names go on the building somewhere. As the, you know, something like that, you know. All right, we're jumping ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Um, all right, communication and community updates. Sorry, any other comments on the building? No? Okay, cool. Step forward, which is good. Yes, Tim. Uh, so, yeah, relative to community, this is kind of an ongoing conversation we've been having but high level it's you know we're trying to trying to ensure that the school committee I, I wrote down a couple words during the meeting but it's more integrated and accessible within the community um there's lots of ways we can do it i'm sure we can all come up with you know, since i've been on school committee we all come up with different ideas um, but one of the themes that if I've, I've been thinking about is leveraging processes and systems that we have in place if possible right that's logical 
um, the couple that I've, I've talked with Jeff and maybe had a, a conversation as well, are site council and PTO. These low hanging fruit where we can do better. Um, and site council, uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if when we have like the principals here, they tell it, talk about the opening um, members from the site council or at least one joins them and they can kind of share a little bit of, like, it, it might take a little while, it might take one or two years before we get it, but hey, these are some of the themes or key ideas we're thinking about going into the year. And then it's typical we have the principals towards the end of the year and we can not as so you know kind of informal hey these were the priorities these are the things we talked about this is what's important um it may or may not be all that much time then but i think it's it's a bit more of a forcing function it drives more integration um if i was on the state council i would want to say hey what did we do and there is at least some expectations and you know it keeps us a little more in tune with it um, so that was that was one idea that i think we talked about and at least i think jeff you you said the principles like the idea they did. Yeah, we had that one. So, so, like, you know, I, and I think that's easy. Yeah. It's, it's right in place. So, the actual we're meeting the principals that you're at the well, elementary first. They'll have a reference site council. Yeah, no, I think it's great. I've heard different, I've talked to a bunch of folks who've served, and, you know, over the last few years. I've heard different reviews of what they're doing. So, that, that's one. Um, another one, Anna Mae and I were kind of brainstorming a little, and I think some of this existed back in the day, so to speak. But with your PTOs, um, sometimes we've done office hours, things like that. We may do it again. We kind of say, hey, come to, here, come to us. Um, we need to do a better job going out to them. We're, we're, you know, a lot of times locally at the schools is where a lot of the action is, we all know, is, is happening. Um, so I was thinking about it. There's five of us, five PTOs. Wouldn't it be great if each one of us chose a, a PTO and we're a little more coordinated with that PTO? You know, it allows them to have their meetings as they always do, but we can come in maybe once in a while and say, hey, what are the priorities, what are the themes, things along those lines. That's something we were doing pre-pandemic too, and I think the last couple of years, we've just been running so hard that it's been almost impossible to kind of yeah. do it, but if we want to go back to that. But so way back when, it was a bit more formalized in yeah. terms of like the CSA, mm -hmm. I was the right. CSA rep to the school right. committee, I would just yeah. sit there, there was a reporter there, you know, and then I would report back at the CSA meeting. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great that Tim really wants to initiate like building more bridges within the community. And we have to go out there as well. So, yeah, so and I've, I've at least talked to um, some of the couple of PTO, some of the leaders that, you know, what do they think? And they love the idea, right? And now, again, some of it happens anyways. I'll go to a PTO meeting here or there yeah. um, or a site council meeting. Give them a heads up just to be um, light, so to speak. Um, but it's getting a little more like integrated in there, and see what see where it goes. Um, so those are two that I consider low hanging fruit. I think that concept we can continue to apply it. Like um, CPAC, maybe somebody's more integrated there it would make sense. Um, so uh, I think we wanted to keep that on the agenda as part of our workshop. Yeah. Um, for other ideas that are similar, and maybe you know, we can see if it, you know, I'd, I'd love feedback on that. If, if, you know, that, that seems like a logical one. So you're thinking that one for each PTO and then one for CPAC? That's the one? You yeah, I think. On the CPAC too, and so so I, I think with the site council and the PTO is like that system's in place, it's very easy. Um, there are definitely other CPAC that's there as well. Yeah. Then you start, you can start moving. This can continue to evolve to a whole bunch of other areas that I Which think. Which then ends up making a whole lot of effort for the school committee members as well. I mean, I think we need to kind of look at our, our workload as well. Yes. How so do we make that we'll happen in a way? In the workshop. Yeah. Is we'll discuss this a little bit yeah. more. Yeah. You're right. We used to do this. We had a schedule of all right. the PTOs, and we'd see, all right, who's free to who come? Who can go? Who can go? Yeah. And, or who so, can do office hours? Yeah. Or who can do this? Or, and yeah. it became kind of really. So I think we can kind of get into the weeds of mm -hmm. how this looks like and what we're capable of doing right. in the workshop. But I do think this is this is a great step forward again to build more bridges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I know that each school keeps the calendar documents, right? You know, with the site council meeting and stuff. You know. I, and then I know it's, we could try to go through, and I'll try to do that, but maybe if we get added just as an invite, um, so that just awareness you know, levels. Sometimes they, um, you know, 
with the way work schedules work these days for people working from home, myself included. Um, there are times I'll have a chunk of time. I think they usually happen on the mornings, right? So I would have that time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, yeah. yeah, so I would like to, you know, I'm okay with us kind of maybe each owning one. Like I liked his idea too, like on that, but at the same time, you know, I want to be able to, I, like I mentioned, I, I made a point that's going to make a be a part of you know, more part of CPAC this year. Um, but also, I'm very interested in the middle school and what's going on at the middle school too. So, after my first pin night last night. So, <laughs> right. yeah, so and, and that's what I think yeah. there's like I, I call it lower hanging fruit. There is don't, definitely don't always need to do more. I'm afraid Mr. Fink will say that you think that everybody is a group. I, I'm not um, low hanging and I don't want to go there. Um, so I'm going to be said, I just think there's some that seem pretty easy to, to start to take on. There are others where we are going to say, hey, wait, we do this, what about this and that? And it, it can yeah. get um, very easily, we can find ourselves in where we, we're not doing any of it. Yes. Or we're not, or we're not, you know, we're, we're doing some, but um, I thought of the site council was an easy, you know, relatively easy one. The PTO, I think some of it's already happening. Yeah. Um, but we should talk about that a little more. Um, it's definitely an ongoing conversation. There's a lot more there. I think it's as we said. Yes, definitely. Um, and Jeff, I'm not quite sure, you know, nowadays when they how they bring in the new CPAC members, or not sorry, the new like state council members. I think it would be something that they, you know, it would be good for them to hear that. Hey, you know, there's, there's a little thing there. And again, the PTOs, they're glad to share like presidents so we can have somebody reach out. You know, we don't have to meet to do that. That can always happen anyway. So mm -hmm. we try to make it simple. You know, like we always you just like I hadn't thought of that. Hey, if you're dealing with like, yeah, maybe he's also talking about be like site council because they'd be getting you know, well that if you that, can do a PTO of a building that you're not in and you have the perspective of where your own kid is. Right. I mean there might be some yes, yeah, so let's talk about that there. in the yeah. workshop. Exactly. Perfect. In the workshop I, I probably won't be well, that's why I'm being that. aware of all of it. I mean I I can go to as many stuff, you know, but I see it right on there. Like, I've got a lot of things happening and I get time. I'm looking about how to go to it. Right? So, I think it's more just awareness. So. Super. Thanks, Tim. Great. And donations. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I ask that you approve the following donation uh, $25 from Nancy Featherman to the high school gift account. This donation was made in honor of MHS teacher John Coco Jr., who passed away uh, in the springtime. We have a motion of, to approve that donation. Uh, motion to approve. Yeah. Motion. Jess? Yes. Second? Second. Second, Michelle. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you very much. Um, any other last any comments this evening? Lily? Lily. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> How's it going? Beginning of senior year. It's good. Busy. Vibe, feeling good. I mean, I know when the student council's end, we're just getting ready for the pep rally because it's earlier this year. It's oh, when 7th. is it? October 7th. Oh, really early. early? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's because we want it outside again and it has to be cool. Yes, it has to be. He was pretty chilly <laughs> last year, wasn't he? Yeah. Okay, Great fine. idea. Tough excuse. Well, we're very grateful that you're here with us. Thank you. Uh, any comments? Oops. I'll close them. Yeah. I just want to say I attended my first pin night. I know I said it a couple times, but uh, I was uh, very impressed with the staff on the sixth grade. Uh, and it was a well oiled machine. Uh, I got to see, you know, Mr. Vaughn shed a tear or two, which is, I guess, part of the. It is. Part it's of part the, of the mythology. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, very relevant information. Uh, so I was. Uh, the, the school culture and the, you know what was engaged there was the uh, and of course he's had a long time to, to work with them you know as a, as a team so they just seem very in tune so uh, and shout out to mr millard who had the out of all the teachers he's the one that had an icebreaker for us so <laughs> first thing we did is he gave us an assignment <laughs> that's well anyone else I, I, I want to mention that I'm very grateful that the school, um, our schools now have a partnership with McLean, mm -hmm. and I think that is a very positive um, partnership that I'm grateful for. I just want to announce Medfield Coalition for Suicide Prevention. We're having, I think it is like fourth or fifth yoga on the turf on 
Sunday at 1230. And if you folks have noticed the purple lights in town, that is for suicide awareness, which is the month of September. And um, so the one I saw recently, that I would say the culture fest. I don't know if I've seen that in some emails. But, uh, yeah, through Bell Forge. Yeah, oh, maybe just to get a support me. Cool. Yeah, that. but that's, mm -hmm. that's something we should keep our eyes and ears open for us yeah. to advocate and uh, make people aware. Cool. That's a great one. Super. So I believe our workshop, I'll confirm that up with the dates, but it's planned for the 23rd, 1030. And um, and then our meeting after that is October 13th. So do we have a motion to adjourn? Sorry, did you have any closing? Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm no, facing this I, way, okay. I'm sorry. That's all right. I, I just wanted to um, just say we've had a great start to the school year. I mean, our, our first couple of days, uh, we started doing our kickoff outside um, during oh, yeah. COVID and we continue that now because it, it's just such a great vibe. We yeah. Everyone's outside. Uh, we have breakfast together and then we all go on the bleachers and, and do our opening. So it's just a really good time. So um, teachers have been great, kids have been great. So we're just had a really good positive start. So. Alrighty, super. Now the motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Jess, second? Second. Second, Michelle, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Alrighty, thank All right. you. Thank you. Thank you.